The Claire Neat Podcast is independently produced in Calgary, Alberta, Canada by me, Sean Perrin, with the assistance of Megan Taylor, who's our copy editor, and Brian Shaples, who's our audio editor. The show is made possible in part by listener support from clarinetists all around the world just like you. Special thank you this month to Pat, Renee, Tammy, and Simon for becoming our newest monthly patrons. If you'd like to learn how you can support the show on a monthly basis for less than the cost of one read per month and get access to an ad-free version of the show at the same time, head to clarineat.com slash support. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy today's special back-to-school episode of the Clarineat Podcast. So it's that time of year where students all around the world are heading back to school, and uh, the luckiest of those pick the clarinet, of course, and the luckiest of those luckiest are, of course, here listening to the Clarinet Podcast. So thanks so much for listening. Um, you know, students, though, can be at any level. This could be your first day of junior high band. You could also be going into your last year of graduate school and kind of wondering where to go after that. Maybe you're a returning player who took a long break after a career and the kids have left home and it's time to start taking up your favorite high school hobby again. Or you know what, maybe you're a seasoned professional who's realized that we just never stop growing and learning as musicians. So this episode, no matter who you are, I hope it's for you and I hope you'll find it interesting. What I've done is I've put together four of my favorite educational moments from the podcast, one which uh, puts science and music together and actually lets you get longer life out of your reads and stay healthier at the same time. The next conversation features a uh, bit of advice for how to better win auditions and how to use technology and modern apps and recording techniques to do so. Along those same lines, many of you are probably thinking of using an iPad for your music this year, and I know that I've tried that before and never become a huge fan of it, but we meet the person who probably pioneered the idea and invented the air turn pedal for the iPad and literally wrote a book on how to go paperless with your music. Lastly, we have a story shared by one of the 20th century's most prominent bass clarinet players about his experience taking up the bass clarinet when he first started, and the passion just is unbelievably evident even in his later years, and unfortunately he passed away rather soon after this uh, podcast was recorded, I believe within the year, um, which is really, truly unfortunate. He will be sorely missed. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. This was a lot of fun putting together, and I hope that if you are new here, you will check out the back catalog of Clarinet episodes. We're approaching almost 100 now, and there's just so much value in those episodes for new players and old players alike to enjoy. So thank you so much for listening. Today's episode of the show is brought to you in part by Daddario Woodman's and their new weekly trivia show called Don't Blow It. You can check it out every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on their Instagram channel, and if you know the right answers to the questions, you might even get the chance to win some amazing new gear. If you haven't had the chance to try out Daddario's new reserve clarinet reads, I absolutely suggest that you do and you're in for a real treat. They're using some amazing new technology and manufacturing techniques that are helping achieve super consistent results. These reads are now available at your local music store, or you can head to clarinet.com slash reads to buy a box online right now. And now I bring you John Mackey, who is actually a biomedical researcher at the University of Alberta and found a way to get longer lasting reads and stay healthier at the same time by mixing his expertise in medical research and science with music foundation of, of Rejuvenate is actually science. And uh, reed cane is essentially uh, a type of wood fiber. And uh, it, that means it's uh, made up of proteins uh, that uh, in particular uh, have strength that you'd like to preserve. And it turns out that uh, after reading a lot about wood degradation, uh, it was very clear uh, from the reading I had that for wood out in the environment, it was the wet dry cycle combined with microbial growth, uh, bacteria, but particularly fungi, so yeasts and molds that actually give off a, a class of enzymes called cellulases. And they, these break down the cellulose protein that, that provides the integrity and strength of a cane reed fiber uh, and provides you know the, the physical characteristics you need for a reed to perform well. So I read about this and then I had to confirm that that in fact was happening to, to reeds. And, and the way I had always handled reeds is how I'd been taught as a youngster. I would, you know, wet my reed with saliva or water, and then I would allow it to dry on a on a flat surface, often a glass plate, uh, and then, you know, rehydrate when it was time to use again. And uh, even with, you know, very care, careful attention to reed care, I, I found that uh, reeds were breaking down. It turns out when I took those reeds and cultured them in Petri dishes, it was very clear that uh, that the germs that we all have in our mouth, which includes bacteria and yeast, were a major contributors to the breakdown of the reeds. 
So if I was able to sterilize uh, the reed, uh, it would last and be stronger using this tonometer test. It would last, you know, four to eight times longer uh, simply because of the, the sterile conditions. And in addition, the wet dry cycle uh, contributed about a third to the rapidity of the reed breakdown. So I, you know, I've, I had all these data that I had generated in in my basement lab after hours, and uh, <laughs> uh, and with you know uh, with some expertise and and consultation with some really bright people at the University of Alberta, and then I started thinking, well, what what can we do to prevent this? Well, you know, the first thing we can do, well, keep humidity stable, right? it would stop the, the wet dry cycle that puts stresses on the fibers. So of course, that means you have to keep it at a constant humidity. But the problem was, if you humidify a reed, uh, it, it tends to become moldy, and then you've lost any benefits you might have gained. So, you know, there are many ways to suppress mold and yeast. But but the key of it, a point is that uh, yeast uh, dyes, it's very sensitive to ethanol, to alcohol. Hmm. So uh, ethyl alcohol, so ethanol, is actually the key chemical component that makes the reed juvenate system work. So what we've decided to do is, you know, at first I would, you know, store these in, in reagent grade alcohol and they lasted for a long time. But it isn't a good commercial solution because uh, it's expensive, um, you know, 100% reagent grade alcohol. And uh, of course, a lot of musicians are, are students and, and children and you, you can't advise them to go out and get, you know, <laughs> 200 proof moonshine uh, to store their reeds. So uh, I was looking around for pot potential solutions and then it turns out that original formula Listerine, so it has to be the, ye the yellow original formula Listerine, has 27.8% ethanol in it. So uh, we reduced the amount of ethanol down to that, found that it seemed to work beautifully. Uh, we swapped over to original formula Listerine and uh, found that the reed performance and longevity uh, was much, much improved. So, okay, so we had a, a solution in theory, but there was no real way to make it practical and scale it up. Um, you know, I had Petri dishes and I had uh, big plastic containers uh, but we wanted something that was useful. So that's when we went into design mode and we came up with what is now the uh, re rejuvenate design. So this opens up about, oh man, maybe a hundred questions that I have now. Um, before we move on to the design, I just sort of want to expand on a couple of those points. So first of all, you're saying that the reeds break down simply by drying and becoming wet again. Is that correct? And it, yeah, it, it, when combined it, with the yeast and things in your mouth? Well, it's a, there are two factors that are involved, but the wet dry cycle alone is enough to break wood down. So if you've got plywood outside or your, your deck uh, and it gets wet and it gets dry, wet and dry, just the expansion of the wood uh, and the contraction uh, physically disform, uh, you know, deforms the material and it, it breaks down the reed. That's, that's one component. It's about a third of the problem according to our tonometry tests. And so the other issue then is that so we can keep them wet with, there's other reed cases that do offer the sort of uh, the moistening. But the thing is, is that I like about this one is that the Listerine is actually taking care of the bacteria and the yeast that's on there. And I wanted to ask you this, you know, as someone who's dealing with health care, do you think that there are health benefits to not having that yeast and, and mold and things on there? I mean, this winter I had a horrible, horrible winter. I had strep throat several times and I only resolved it actually by tossing all my reeds and uh, starting afresh, which of course was not the greatest. And some people say, oh, you can't catch the same thing twice or whatever. But I'm pretty sure that sticking a you know, disgusting, old, smelly <laughs> reed into your mouth, even if it's well taken care of, like it just seems like a bad idea. So what, what do you think the health benefits are of this, if any? Well, I agree. I mean, when I put on my, my medical doctor hat, I, I went and looked through all the literature on this. And in fact, there are a fair number of publications where uh, people have a higher rate of infection if you're a reed or woodwind player. So brass players and clarinet, sax, oboe, bassoon players actually have more respiratory tract infections than, than drummers and string players. Yes, so I believe that, that 100%. Yeah. 
and and so there's data on that. It's not fully explained, but the most likely issue is the hygiene that one has when one plays a, a woodwind instrument. In addition, there have been cases where people have developed allergic reactions to the mold in their in their mouthpieces and reeds, and it causes a, syn, a syndrome that's basically pulmonary uh, hyper eosinophilic. Uh, uh, respiratory disorders. And, and so you can get medical conditions from allergies to the molds. And, and there are case reports of woodwind musicians that only got better after they dropped playing their, their woodwind instruments simply because of the contamination of the reed with, uh, with yeast that was pathogenic. So what did you find on the Petri dish then? Because this has been an experiment I've wanted to run before is to swab my reeds and see all the gross stuff on there. But <laughs> Well, if, if you're actually that interested, we we have pictures of some of the things we've grown. Oh, please uh, on share reeds. with me, yeah. Uh, well, I can I can send them to you, but they're also on our website if you go to oh, www.readjuvenate.com slash science. Uh, it, it actually gives the scientific uh, background behind it. And yeah, there's some gross Petri dish uh, pictures where we just basically took a standardly played reed, and, and these are—I hate to say it—these are my reeds, and I'm I'm pretty <laughs> fastidious about oral hygiene and keeping things clean. So I was uh, a little surprised myself when I saw how quickly uh, various things grew, and and certainly we see yeast uh, of various species grow, and and the microbial flora in the mouth uh, uh, grow on reeds as well as as microbes that we don't normally find in high quantities in the mouth. I think there's something about having that dry, colder environment that other species we don't normally see growing uh, in the mouth are also being uh, cultured from the reeds. So, yeah, it's it's an issue. And I think, you know, if you do good mouthpiece uh, cleaning as well as keep your reeds uh, sterile, uh, I think you're more likely to, to have uh, fewer uh, upper respiratory tract infections. Yes. If you found this conversation interesting and want to experience the Rejuvenate product for yourself, I'm happy to say that it's one of the products I have hand-selected for sale on the Clarinet online store. I just love the fact that not only is it a unique and innovative product, but it's also Canadian. And uh, John City is about three hours drive from mine, so he's literally in the same province. So go Alberta, go Canada, and check out the Rejuvenate if you're interested. At the time of this recording, I believe there are $29 US, and they can ship worldwide. Also, if you'd like to listen to the rest of this conversation, it's episode 58. You can search that in your uh, podcast player or on the website. If you are listening on a podcast player like Spotify or Apple Music or uh, sorry, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, I would invite you to subscribe and also please leave me a rating and review. This helps other people discover the podcast and when they do discover it, it helps them know what it's about. Uh, further, I love getting the feedback and hearing from people all over the world where they're from. Um, if you'd rather send me a direct message, you can do this at feedback at clarinet.com. I do reply to every message that I receive and I really appreciate you taking the time to write in. Next on the show here, I've got a short snippet from a conversation I had with Jason Heath. He wrote a book called Winning the Audition, and I know that that's something that a lot of students are really focused on right now as they try to get to first chair in their local band programs or, you know, maybe the uh, regional orchestra or something like that. Um, he talks a little bit about not only his book, but some of the, the great things in there, but also some of the recording techniques that he uses in order to, to listen back and improve his performance. So this is super valuable. If you're not recording yourself, you really ought to start. And it's never been easier than at this point in history, where we literally have a high quality recording device in our pocket, basically at all times. So anyways, this is Jason. He and if you'd like to check out his podcast, you can do that at ContrabassConversations.com. It's not just recording yourself in general. It's how are you recording yourself and how are you using that info? That's something that I think the people that have been successful, what they've done that's a little bit different. And a couple takeaways, one that I heard over and over again was recording yourself in a large space and putting your recorder where the committee's going to sit, not in your little, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot practice room with the sound bouncing around. It sounds so different putting your put it, getting into a hall and recording a hundred feet away. And how do you sound from there and what stands out and how are your dynamics? And people, when, when I ask people about their aha moment, which I did frequently throughout this whole process, that was one of the things that really kind of help them to turn the corner for their audition preparation. And then the other thing that I heard, and I love this, and I've been doing this ever since hearing this from several people is a great way to, to record is wake up, tune your instrument, and then just play the list down beginning to end 
for your recorder. Turn it off, go get a drink of water, stretch out or something, listen back, and that, you cold at your least glamorous, you know, you're without warming up for a half hour, that's your most likely litmus test of what you're probably going to sound like in an audition and using that to base your preparation. When people did that and they just got a cold, hard, on warmed up uh, recording of themselves and then use that, that was another big turnaround in terms of, of using recording technology. Um, yeah. What's in your bag nowadays as far as stuff that you do carry around? Um, let's say you want to go practice and record yourself and and what does it look like? So for me, it's like, am I trying to get something that I, that's like truly high production quality or is it just for my own, uh, gorilla kind of DIY practicing purposes? I'll carry my iPhone and maybe, I don't know if I have it near me, but I, I, and then I have one of these Logitech, I think Bluetooth speakers that really cranks out a ton of sound and I'll bring that in my iPhone and maybe, and I have a, I forget the brand, but I have a lightning adapter microphone. That's pretty good. And mm-hmm. I'll, I'll bring that. That's like my real small bag of gear besides with, just the phone. With regards to the iPhone, what are some of your favorite apps that help you prepare for the audition process or what are some that guests shared? Sure. Absolutely. I have uh, and I can I'll send you a link. I did a talk in 2015 on useful music apps and apps that I use in my own teaching, but I also use them for audition preparation. And some of them include and I actually have my iPhone here so I can open it up in terms of metronome. I love this app called Metronomics. And mm. I don't know if you've played with that at all, but it's like no. a Dr. Beat style metronome, but it even has some additional th- things. You can set all the subdivisions to different sounds and you can set the probability that a subdivision will go off. So you could, for example, set a 16th note pattern, but you could change some of the, you could have it so that the the beat, beats one, two, three, and four always happen. But you could take all the other 16th notes in the bar and you could set them to like 80, 85% probability. So it will play, it's almost like a drummer playing along with you at that point, making up their own pattern. You can also set two bars of clicking and two bars of silence. So you can practice something and it'll be like yucka ducka 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 and then it'll not click for two bars. Mm. And you keep playing and see how accurate you are coming in in terms of that. I love that app. Four score is an app that I use a lot. I'm not sure if you use that, but it's great for just whole, uh, it's just a great PDF music repository and it has a metronome built in and you can write on the music and so four score i love a tonal energy in terms of a tuner metronome combo i haven't found anything on ios that's better than tonal energy and that it's a great drone and one thing i love is it's actually loud enough that at least for bass i can use it without a speaker and i can actually hear the drone that's a problem i'm sure for clarinet too but if you have some wimpy drone coming out of your iphone speaker you aren't even going to be able to hear it tonal energy really has a nice sawtooth wave you can use that's loud and that one will it has so many different modes you can have a drone with a metronome going you can even do this goofy It's kind of like an auto tune thing where you'll play and it will play the pitch that you're playing along with you. So if you want to practice something slow, yeah, it's very weird, but it does work. And, and I don't practice with that a ton, but I do sometimes. And it even has this amplitude kind of practice mode where you can practice and it'll show you the, the shape of the sounds that you're creating. And I found that really useful, especially with teaching for dynamics like with a student, I'll have them play some of the, like, no, that's not really forte. We need to get to this decibel level. That's forte. Or you hear how that sustain is, or you hear how you're releasing that note and you can actually see the shape of the sound that they're playing. So that app can't say enough good things. And then one more I'll mention is AnyTune Pro. AnyTune Pro is, there's a, a computer program that's been around for years called the Amazing Slowdowner, but AnyTune allows you to take real recordings and put them into the app, and then you can slow them down, and it preserves the integrity of the recording. So you can take the Berlin Philharmonic playing Beethoven 5, and you can actually slow it down to half tempo and not have it sound like a ridiculous mess. It actually kind of sounds like the Berlin Philharmonic playing half tempo. So I found that, and you can adjust the A. So for example, if you're, if you have 
eight recordings you love of excerpts, but they're all slightly different A. That's a very common problem. In this app, you can move it so that they're all A440 or A442, which oh, just wow. takes, yeah, it takes a lot of hassle out of practicing with recordings. And you can set loops so it'll continue to loop different excerpts. You can bookmark the loops. So you can have like Brahms 2 and you have two excerpts. You can just set them as loops and you can practice one, then practice the other. So those are some of my favorite apps. If you enjoyed this conversation, you can check it out in its entirety at clarinet.com. It's episode 52. Also, of course, his book, Winning the Audition. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And his podcast, Contrabass Conversations. Jason now has over a thousand episodes in the back catalog there. So I want you to dive in and check those out, but don't stray too far. You might not come back for quite a long time. <laughs> the next guest is also a podcast host. His name is Hugh Sung, and he probably became one of the first people to be a paperless musician by using a tablet computer turned on its side in the late 90s. He had a problem, though. He couldn't flip the pages easily, and he actually created a solution and, uh, through an entrepreneurial twist of fate, met someone that helped him bring that solution to market. So this is Hugh Sung. Uh, check out his podcast as well before we move on here. It's called The Musical Life, and he's interviewed everybody from me to Anthony McGill to Yo-Yo Ma on that show. And uh, while I believe it's currently on a hiatus while Hugh pursues other projects, as entrepreneurial people tend to do, um, it's still definitely definitely worth checking out. I believe it's amusicallife.com. It, it started with me being totally absent-minded. I'm one of the most forgetful people uh, when it comes to paper. I lose things so easily. And as a collaborative pianist, as an accompanist, I'm required to learn thousands of pieces of music and have access to all that, all that music as well because I play with just about every instrument you can think of. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the road or gone to a rehearsal, gone to a lesson, or even gone to concerts, only open up, opening up my bag only to discover I forgot my music. I left something. In fact, I've got this story. Anthony McGill, when he was a student, he had asked me to uh, accompany him for a major audition in New York City. I'm driving up the New, York, the New Jersey Turnpike, and uh, I, at that time I lived about two hours away from New York City. Halfway up, an hour into the drive, just something was nagging me at the back of my brain. I checked my bag, and to my horror, I forgot one major piece of his repertoire. Oh, my or, God. And so I called him on the road and said, Anthony, I am so sorry. I forgot the music. And he's, you know, he's getting ready to do his audition, and there was no time for me to drive back and back to New York. And fortunately... You know, he, as he told me later, he did find another pianist, <laughs> but I felt like I just ruined his career. You know, and I've done this with other artists. I, I've, I, I was touring with Hilary Hahn. I forgot music on the stage in our, one of the venues and the next location we went to, I forgot the music. <laughs> I had to run out, look for something at the local music store, the music library. Aaron Roseanne, we flew to St. Louis. I forgot some sheet music, some rare sheet music there. And just the stress of remembering if I packed that stupid piece of paper with me <laughs> was so overbearing. I st and, and I started dreaming, boy, wouldn't it be great if there's some way I could carry all my music with me digitally? Now, keep in mind, this is many years ago. Uh, the only types of portable computers were laptops, okay? Microsoft, Microsoft started coming out with these, this mobile operating system called Windows CE. And this really dates me, okay? And so they were coming up with these, you know, these small, what we called back in those days, portable, uh, port, um, personal digital assistants, PDAs. Uh, the Palm Pilot was an example of one very popular back then. And then they started coming up with larger and larger form factors. And then my dream was, oh, I wish they would come up with something that would be large enough for a sheet of music. But there were two problems. There were still the music was still in what we call landscape mode. You could only see it in a laptop view. And if you've ever tried to see a piece of music on a laptop, the old-fashioned kind of laptops, you can only realistically see half a page at a time, which would mean you would cut off you know, the, the page in the middle, which works for some music, doesn't work for others. There's no way to see a full page in portrait mode vertically back then. That's what's so frustrating about using uh, software to write music yeah. on computers. Yes. So finally in 2001, Microsoft came up with the tablet PC running Windows XP. And this was the very first computer that could actually rotate 
the view of uh, a view of a piece of paper, a document in portrait mode where you could see a full page at a time, not half a page at a time. For me, that was my light bulb moment. I thought, finally, I could actually read music on one of these devices. They were prohibitively expensive back then, but I went ahead, bought, bought one of those units. I scanned some music and I, I took it out, you know, tried it out and I fell in love. It was great. Even back then, the primitive technology, the music looked great and it even came with pens where you could draw ink markings on the music and it felt like a smooth Mont Blanc pen, gorgeous annotations that you could draw. The only problem was you could only read one page at a time. So the new situation for me was, okay, now I've got to find a way to turn the pages, right? I didn't want to have to use a keyboard or a mouse and use my hands to turn the pages. I mean, we're talking digital technology. There must be a way to do it with some sort of a pedal. So I started searching around for page turning pedals and I Googled pedals, pedals, you know, pedal controllers. I couldn't find anything. The funny thing was it took me a while to realize that the industry term for that was, because I was thinking as a pianist, pianists, we work with pedals, the damper pedal, the soft pedal, the unicorda pedal. But in business or in industry, they use the word foot switch. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long time to figure out the word foot switch before I started finding commercial foot switches. So I, I, I bought a couple of them, and the problem with them was that they all clicked. They all used read switches. So every time you press them, you hear click, 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 which is annoying, especially if you're trying to make a, a CD recording. Um, or in, even in performance, the people would hear it off the stage. They'd hear me funny click, click every time I turned the page. Um, they all were wired. They had USB cables that you had to plug into the computers. And so they looked awful. You see this cable dangling down from the, uh, from the music rack on the piano. And they were all required some level of programming. And so, I mean, I was sort of comfortable with it, but for the average non-techie musician, this was just going to be too difficult to use. So my dream was, boy, if I could come up with a silent, simple, sleek, in other words, wireless page turner, that would be my dream. So anyway, the, the, the tablet PC continued to evolve, and I continued to experiment with my own different contraptions, different iterations of trying to modify switches that were never really meant to be used the way I was using them. They were all either hand switches that I tried to create different cradles for for my foot. The problem was they were either not completely reliable. Well, actually, most of them were not very reliable. But they were all ugly. They all made noise. Well, the noise is actually very interesting to me. I want to touch on that for a second because sure. you have found actually something very intriguing, and that is that within design, I know it's it's considered good design to give feedback. So you press the, the home button on your cell phone. It should give you some tactile or auditory feedback to let you know that you've done that outside yes. of the operating system. But what they didn't think about is all the uses. And so you sort of found a new use for this idea of product mm -hmm. and, and completely a niche market which they couldn't even have dreamed of, you know? Exactly, exactly. And because the, the, the clicking was intended to be tactile feedback, but, but I didn't want that. <laughs> exactly, because in this case, and I guess they hadn't considered, but for someone like a musician, the clicking is the very thing that's letting you know you turned the page is detracting right. from the performance. Like, exactly. you know you've turned the page because you're looking at it. <laughs> exactly. So the story is, one day I'm giving a recital at the Curtis Institute of Music. One of the, I accompanied a lot of the student recitals. After the recital, this woman comes up to me backstage, and she has this wild look in her eyes. My friend and I have been looking all over, searching the world for somebody like you for the past five years. <laughs> she wow. gave me her business card, invited me to come out to Colorado. Long story short, I met my future business partner, Lester Carplus. Lester Carplus had started 13 other companies. He was a, a, a serial entrepreneur. I'd never met one like that in person. And so he proposed going into business together because he, he had been looking for a, a musician, uh, a top-tier professional musician who was also comfortable with technology. And then back in those days, well, even today, it's very hard to find somebody who's comfortable in both. You have people in technology who know, you know not, as, not enough about music 
to be known in the music world, right? Mm-hmm. And you have musicians, most musicians, <laughs> they, you know, they, they only have a passable, passing knowledge of technology, certainly not, you know, not the level that we would need to start an actual tech company. And so in me, he found that rare person that had both qualities. And so we went into business together and started AirTurn. So I would consider myself a very uh, technologically well-rounded person. But I, the digital music thing has always been a wall for me. I've never found, I had an iPad, and honestly, when I went to sell it, I, I couldn't find it under my bed. It had been so long since I used it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think part of the problem was because the screen, even though it was larger than anything we'd ever seen up until then, um, it was still not big enough as a sheet. But now, of course, they have the iPad Pro, and I'm, I'm thinking of trying this again. Yeah, what what tips do you have, though? Like, are there, is there a certain app that lets you mark up the music, or how does that work? I actually wrote a book on the subject, and the book is called From Paper to Pixels, Your Guide to the Digital Sheet Music Revolution. You can actually find the book on Amazon. Uh, it's available as a paperback or as, ki- as a Kindle download, and also available as a file download for iBooks. Wow, I'll have to check that out. Yes. I'll put a link to that in the show notes so everyone can go and, and, and have a read of that. But what about battery life? I mean, I another concern of mine is, you know, I, I know that we'd like to think it it will last the whole concert, but maybe for whatever circumstance it won't. Have you, have you had issues with this or no? You know, with the iPad, it's never been an issue. You know, with the old computers, yes, that was always a fear. So I would have a, a power cord running from the, the, the old tablet PCs, which would have maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, more likely a 30 minutes of battery oh, time. Oh, it was bad so in those days. So it was days. terrible. Back in those days, it was terrible. But the iPads run for 10 hours. You know, so yeah, that's true. I, I don't even bring my power cord with me when I go for a full day of work. It's amazing. So with the iPad, it's power has never been an issue. I simply I, and it's become a habit. I just charge my iPad every night and in the morning it's ready to go. And the air turns themselves. It's funny. Uh, the air turns average about 80 hours of battery life. I'll charge them maybe once a month. <laughs> wow. And I can go a whole month with all the work that I do and just remember to charge it once a month or so. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, th- I was thinking just now, too, these would be so good for percussionists because um, obviously you're using your hands. You can't exactly flip pages while you're playing something like a marimba with four mallets in your hands. Mm-hmm. And uh, many times, because you're looking at larger scores, y- your parts are multiple sheets long. So yeah. it would just yeah, be absolutely. brilliant. And so, you know, the air turn not only works with the iPad, it'll also work. We designed it uh, at as a universal controller. So it works with Android tablets as well. It also works with Mac and PC. So conceivably, you could get a big screen PC or a big screen Mac and you know, a good 20, 23 inch monitor and read your music much more comfortably, even read two pages at a time with some software as well. So lots of options. Digital music gives you the freedom to resize your music and there are even low vision options depending on the apps that you're using. So there's a lot more flexibility. And my book actually goes into a lot of the, the apps and applications and techniques for viewing music on different kinds of monitors and screens and devices. And even though the book is a few years old, one of the things I was very mindful of is because I've been paperless for so long, I wanted to share timeless principles that have allowed me to use the same scores that I you know, scanned in 15 years ago that I still use today to help people understand that if you understand the basics of the technology, this will serve you for many, many, many more years to come. You don't have to worry about being obsolete if you understand the underlying technological principles. And that's what my book tries to do in addition to the, you know, the apps that were current at that time, but which you could easily replace nowadays with whatever is um is is available today well i'm gonna have to try it again because i i consider myself to be sort of technologically ahead and then i still show up with my old tree music and well can i <laughs> can i share, can i share an interesting story now this is going to come out with my interview with with anthony when it when it comes out so anthony mcgill uh he is now using air turn the rate the reason he was using an air turn is i i, I remember seeing uh, a facebook an emergency facebook post from him saying Help! I need a Bluetooth page turner. Is there anybody that can help me? He was in, I think he was in Chicago, somewhere in Chicago or some other city. I need one right away. Where can I get one? And so I messaged him back immediately saying, you know, the air turn is now available in guitar center stores around the country. Just go to your local guitar center and you, you should be able to get one. So apparently the reason he needed it was because of exactly what you described, this contemporary score, this modern music that had basically no consideration for page turns. Mm-hmm. And he, so he needed 
then air turn that night he he did it he, he got the air turn performed with it and that's it was really the modern <laughs> music score that forced him to get an air turn for his ipad what a character i had such a great time talking with hugh and i also had a great time being featured on his show about my new album i guess it was new in 2016 um called dream song so maybe i'll put a link to that episode in the show notes if you'd like to check out this one it's in its entirety it's episode 23 of Clarinet. and don't forget to check out not only the air turn pedal but also hugh's podcast at musicallife.com. The last story we've got today is a little more grassroots. It's not technologically or science-based. It's just a real person who became one of the biggest innovators in the clarinet scene, probably of the last hundred years. Harry Sparnai discovered the tenor saxophone when he was younger. He loved that low, rich sound. But then he switched to the clarinet because at the time of his being a student, you couldn't study the saxophone seriously. However, he always missed that dark sound of the saxophone. And I'll let him explain the story of how he managed to combine his love of that dark, rich tone with the love of the clarinet together. My beginning was a little bit different because when the, I was young, you, you know that, you read the book, uh, I played saxophone, the tenor, tenor saxophone. And when I wanted to be a musician, my father said, okay, you have to study uh, the conservatory because there are enough street musicians. I want that you study. Okay, and I go to the conservatory. But at that time, the saxophone was completely forbidden. It was a dirty instrument. It was, yeah, I'm, we are speaking about 1960, eh? 1960. Yeah. Now, now the saxophone is accepted in all the places, but at not in my time. No, man, no, man, not at all. So I came there with my saxophone <laughs> and they looked at me very, very strange. And they said, but what, 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 what are you playing? And I said, um, I want to play, uh, uh, well, you needn't from Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. And they said, what? And I was playing as a tenor sax and I made an uh, improvisation, blah, blah, blah. And nobody, nobody wanted to have me. Only one guy, and that was the clarinet professor. He said, "Yes, I want that that guy. I want that." And he told, he spoke with me, and he said, "Yeah, but you have to speak. You have to uh, uh, play clarinet. But don't worry. That is also good for your saxophone technique." And I said, "Okay, no problem. I wanted to be a musician, so I started clarinet. But I always missed the sound of the sax, the, the tenor saxophone." So I was practicing more and more and more and more, and life changed. I started playing more clarinet, always more contemporary pieces than the classical pieces. I remember one time I was playing Weber, and my professor looked at me and he said to me, you don't like it, eh? And I said, no, I don't like it at all, I'm sorry. And he said to me, yes, but you have to practice it. He said, okay, no problem. But you don't need to play it. Oh, say, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so you really think, did, did your father's encouragement then to seek formal training, how did that shape your career then? How is it different than it would have been? Oh, I think it would have been completely different because my idea was working, for example, in a, in a shop and in the evening playing in a jazz club or with friends, etc., etc. No, it should have been completely different. Completely different. But now I want to uh, uh, go on with the, the, at the end of the study, I had already two uh, degrees for the normal clarinet. And then my professor came with a big case. And I thought, hey, a saxophone, what is this? And then he opened and there was a bass clarinet. And he was a fantastic professor. I loved him. Rui Otto, he was fantastic. And he said uh, to all the students who were, oh, you can blow a little bit. And everybody was blowing a little bit and everybody had a problem. And believe me or not, you can ask him. He is still alive. He is 93. Wow. I played three, four notes. I looked at him and I said, yes, but this is the instrument I want to play. And he looked at me and he said, no, no, Harry, please don't do this. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't do this. You cannot earn your money. Please don't. Yes, I want to play this instrument. I'm sorry. So I finished my uh, last degree for normal playing it. I closed my cases. And then uh, I had to sell my uh, tenor saxophone to buy a bass playing it. And then uh, I started. It was 1967 or 66. Yeah. So let's go back to when you were a student for a second. I mean, really early. Um, back to that day when your parents 
bought you that saxophone. You, yeah. Your mom said she went out for the afternoon and left you at home with this saxophone. And when they came home, you were playing. What, what were those few hours like? I, I, they're fantastic. Oh, I love, oh, I feel still, I get the feeling. I opened the case and I saw the saxophone. I knew a little bit about the mouse piece and the reed, not from the saxophone, because I had a, a, a young uh, a friend who played the clarinet in a harmony band. And so I knew, and I was trying this, and, and uh, you don't need to be very intelligent to know uh, when you see the piano also, you go up, etc. So I saw the keys and I think, okay, I have to close the keys. And I did it in my mouse and I start blowing, of course, completely wrong. So no tonguing uh, right, but I was blowing and there came a note. So I, okay, hey, that's lovely. Yes. And then I close a key. Hey, that's a lower note. That is ah. So that's when I close the key, that's okay. So, and that was going on. And then after three, four hours, I played, oh yeah, I never forget that. And, and a tune very popular in that uh, period it, it was called Tequila. Oh, yes. And, uh, yeah, you can, you know it probably. Yes, yes. Only three notes or four notes. So I did not play a saxophone concerto, eh? but I yeah. played that. So they came uh, at home, my uh, father and mother, and I said, okay, sit down. And they sit down and I played. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and the next day I went to the shop where they bought the saxophone and I said, um, I want to have uh, somebody who uh, uh, give me lessons. And the man said, yeah, but I can do it. And then after a year, he said, no, you, you have to find another guy because I cannot uh, learn you, uh, teach you anymore. Uh, and then uh, I said to my father, okay, I want to do something. I want to be a professional musician. And then, uh, okay, then the whole story starts at the concert or... Just such an incredible level of passion there. I really, really was so happy I had the chance to have Harry on the podcast. It was one of my favorite episodes for sure. And I was deeply saddened to learn of his passing last year. And this is just such a tragic loss for the entire clarinet community all around the world. Um, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I do hope that you enjoyed it. I do hope that you feel inspired to practice more now and maybe have some new techniques to audition with and maybe even have a healthier fall cold season. I know it's super cold here already. It's already snowed about two feet the other day, believe it or not. For those of you living down in Florida, that's the way it is up in Canada here. It's, you know, on October 2nd, it's totally reasonable to expect uh, well over 10 inches of snow or whatever it happens to be. Um, that's just life in Canada. But uh, anyways, the podcast is produced in Calgary, Alberta, Canada by me, Sean Perrin, your host, with the help of Megan Taylor, our copy editor, and Brian Shaples, our audio editor. I also want to thank all those who support the show on Patreon. Without your help, this would not be possible. Real soon, you're going to get to hear a brand new microphone that, thanks to the Patreon supporters' help, I was able to purchase and upgrade the sound quality of the show. Today's episode was brought to you by our season sponsor, Dario Woodwinds, and their new Instagram show called Don't Blow It, which airs every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And I know I keep telling you to check out their new line of reserve clarinet reads available for B-flat, E-flat, and bass clarinet now. And if you haven't done it yet, why not do so? Next time you're at the music store, grab a box, or head to clarinet.com slash reads to order online right now. Thanks so much for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. I look forward to you joining me next time for more of what's new and neat for clarinet with the neatest people in the industry.